Welcome to statistics, everyone. Um, this is going to be the first lecture of many uh, for this course. And in this lecture, the goal is to introduce you to the general topic of statistics, um, as well as introduce you to some categories of statistics, um, some vocabulary, talk about levels of measurement, and also um, sort of wrap up with some of the uh, discussion about the mathematical side of how we often um, approach statistics and some of the types of formulas you might see. So other than the last part of this lecture, you're not going to see a lot of numbers. Um, this is more of a, co a conceptual lecture to introduce you to what you can expect going forward. The reading that would go with this particular uh, lecture is chapter one from your course textbook, and that can be from either uh, the fourth edition or the third edition. So let's go ahead and get started. So if we're taking a class called statistics, we should probably start with the idea of, well, what the heck is a statistic in and of itself? Um, a simple definition of the word statistic is as follows at the top of this PowerPoint. Um, a single number, right? So that's the key thing. A statistic is a single number, um, sometimes referred to as a point estimate, if you want to be fancy. Um, but what does this single number do? It provides a descriptive measure uh, that is calculated from sample data, and we'll talk about the importance of that in a bit, in order to summarize some aspect of that sample. And we hear statistics all the time in everyday life. Um, they're in news reports, they're in social media accounts, they're in research articles, newspaper articles, etc. Um, so even though we're familiar with them and we see them, it's just kind of nice to remind yourself of what exactly, what are some of the examples of a single number that is used to describe some aspect of a sample. So on the bottom half of this slide, I've got several examples of some common statistics you may hear. Probably one of the, the simplest things is sort of the frequency or percentage of respondents or sub research subjects in a sample. So you may hear a statement such as you see there, like 43% of the survey respondents were male. So why do I highlight that? Well, 43% is in fact a single number. And what is it telling us? It's describing some aspect of the sample. It's describing to us a partial breakdown of the gender of that particular sample. So 43% of the survey respondents were male. We move down to the next one, which is the mean, right? And the mean often goes by different names. It's sometimes known as the mathematical balance point. Um, usually we often just hear it sort of referred to as the average, right? So more often than not, when you hear the term average, it's referring to the mean. So the average number of prior arrests within the sample was six prior arrests. So once again, we have a single number, six, that is describing some aspect of that sample. What is it describing? It's describing sort of the, the average or the middle point, the typical number of prior arrests for that sample. Another measure of sort of like the center point or the location or the typical value is the median. Um, and we'll talk later about when to use the mean, when to use the median and how they sort of compare and contrast with one another. So the median in our example, we see it says, the median home price in this neighborhood is $450,000. It's getting a little redundant, but hopefully you get the idea. A single number that is capturing some aspect of that sample. Um, and you'll see when we talk about things like home price, there's a reason why we use the median oftentimes more than we would use the mean. And we'll come to that later. Uh, standard deviation is another example of a statistic. Now, standard deviation doesn't measure sort of the location or the central point of the, the data that you have. Rather, standard deviation gives us an estimate of how spread out are the scores, right? So if you imagine if a bunch of people take a midterm, not everyone's going to get the exact same score on the midterm. No, there's going to be variability, right? There's going to be people who score high, people who score low, people who score near the average, etc., that standard deviation is there to start to give us a way to quantify how spread out people are or the amount of variability that there is. So you can see here with the example, we mentioned the, the mean test score and then we follow with a standard deviation. So the mean test score on the exam was 74 with a standard deviation of 4.3. Um, same idea, a single number describing some aspect of the sample. 
And we'll talk later about how we can sort of interpret statistics such as a standard deviation. And then finally on this slide, we talk about an example where we're working with two variables, not just examining one variable at a time, rather we're examining the association between two variables. And that is typically referred to as the correlation. And we'll be spending some time also talking about Pearson's correlation coefficient, otherwise known as lowercase r. Um, so in our example, we see it says, this study found a strong positive correlation between the number of prior convictions and current sentence length. And that 0 0.65 tells us something about the strength of the association between the two variables, prior convictions and current sentence length. And the fact that it's a positive value and the fact that it's a 0 0.65, these are things that help to inform us about that particular sample. And just like with the other ones, we'll be talking more about correlations going forward. Let's go ahead and move on. So we've talked about what a statistic is, right? It's a descriptive measure calculated from a sample uh, that sort of describes some aspect of that sample, and it's captured in a single number. Well, when we move over to actually using statistics in mathematical formulas, or sometimes when we want to mention the statistics that we ran or computed, uh, within an article or report, rather than writing out the full name of the statistic, we use a symbol, a simple letter um, that will sort of signify what statistic we're talking about. So in this chart, we see some examples of, on the left-hand side, we see three common statistics that are reported in the literature, the mean, the standard deviation, and the correlation coefficient. Um, but oftentimes in mathematical formulas or when we're trying to describe it, in the literature, we'll just use one of the symbols similar to what we see on the right. So for the mean, often what we will see is a lowercase letter X, Y, Z, or really any letter of the alphabet um, that represents a particular variable, variable X, variable Y, but that little flat line over the top of it, that, that is known as the bar over it, that means that now we're talking about the mean. So if we wanted to illustrate the mean for variable X, we would have a little X with a bar over it, or that flat line. Same idea with variable Y. When we look at standard deviation, which we mentioned is a measure of sort of variability or how spread out scores are from one another in a particular sample, we tend to use the lowercase letter S. And then finally with this example, we see when we're trying to um, illustrate the correlation between two variables, the sort of like the gold standard of correlation coefficients is known as Pearson's R. Um, and that's why we use that lowercase letter R to represent correlation. So now that we know what a statistic is, we need to think about, well, how do we start to categorize different types of, statist of statistics? Um, or in a class like this, how do we go about teaching you about statistics? The way that I have set up this course is based upon having us examine the two major branches of statistics. So the first five or six weeks of the course, we're gonna talk about descriptive statistics. And that's what we see at the top of this slide. And there's some bullet points sort of um, defining it and summarizing what it's all about. And I'll come back to that in a second. Then after about five or six weeks into the semester, we will sort of turn the page and cross over into inferential statistics. Now, inferential statistics are gonna be really cool because this is when we really start to examine research questions and get into hypothesis testing and try to explain the world around us um, beyond just describing it. So let's back up a second. Let's look at why do I break it into two different things? Well, descriptive statistics, the first branch of statistics, the goal here is to simply explore your data. So you'll see that it says that it involves exploratory data analysis. So you go out as a researcher and you collect data from all sorts of people, right? You have your sample, maybe you measure age, gender, ethnicity, um, drug use history, uh, criminal offending history, arrest history, whatever your topic is, and you collect a lot of data. Well, before you can go out and start answering your you know, fancy research questions, you need to explore your data. What does it look like? What does my sample represent? I need to describe my sample. That's descriptive statistics. And we're gonna start over the next couple of weeks, we're gonna break into sort of the various 
characteristics of data that we want to sort of pull out. And as you can see with the second bullet point under descriptive statistics, it says utilize summary statistics to describe characteristics of a single set of data. And then there's four sub points to that. So we're going to be walking through that in the next few weeks. When whatever, even if it's something as simple as if I get students take a midterm exam, say I have 40 students in a class, they take a midterm exam, I grade their exams, now I have data. I have data about midterm exam scores. I, if I want to summarize how well my class is doing on that particular test, there are various aspects I'm going to look at. First is location. And so we'll start talking about location, otherwise known as central tendency. So we'll see the statistics that fall under this, things like the mean, the median, the mode. These are the things we'll go into detail about. And location is trying to give us an idea of like, what is the average score? What is sort of the most typical uh, score? What is the common score for that variable? Then we'll move on to another characteristic, which is variability, right? It's one thing to know what is the average or what is the most common response. But we also want to know, well, how different are our responses? What is the amount of variability from performing poor on an exam to performing um, very well on an exam? We want to capture that with numbers. And that's with variability, we'll th see things like the statistic range and variance and standard deviation. Um, then a third characteristic that we will examine under the branch of descriptives is the shape of the distribution. Um, and we'll start talking about things that you may be somewhat familiar with, things like that, that most of us are somewhat familiar with the idea of like a, a normal bell-shaped curve um, for some phenomenon, whether it's about intelligence or height or performance on some outcome. Many things in the world follow what we call as a normally distributed bell-shaped curve. So we'll talk about that. But that goes into this idea of shape. But not everything follows a nice bell-shaped curve. Sometimes things are skewed meaning that the bulk of, of responses are at one end or the other end of a particular spectrum. And we'll see how that is translated into statistics. Things like kurtosis, how high is that quote unquote mountain of that distribution, things of that nature. And then finally under descriptive statistics, once we start to move beyond examining only one variable, but when we start to look at how two or more variables move together, we start to talk about association or correlation. You may have seen that R statistic that we'd mentioned on the previous slides, and that's when we come in and started using that when we talk about association. Finally, under descriptive statistics, we have to think about a lot of things in this world are well translated, not just with numbers, but pictures, right? Audiences like pictures. Um, they're easier to wrap their mind around than just a, a laundry list of numbers. And so under the branch of descriptive statistics, we often utilize a lot of graphical displays, things as simple as a pie chart or a bar chart, um, or more statistic-driven uh, concepts or things like histograms that we'll be seeing in the next couple of lectures, or scatter plots, another type of thing that we'll see and talk about. So once we get through descriptive statistics and the idea of like, how do I break down one or two variables just to describe to my audience and summarize what my data looks like, I now want to start asking research questions. Does this particular thing influence some other thing, right? Um, or do these two particular variables tend to be associated with one another and would that take place in the larger population? And that's where we move into inferential statistics. And so when we get there, we're going to talk about the importance of hypothesis testing in any sort of research, and especially in statistics. This is hypothesis testing is all about how do we use sample data, data from a small subsection of the overall population, but we use that sample data to try to make inferences or estimates about that larger population that we're trying to describe or trying to represent. And that's where inferential statistics comes in. Now, obviously you can imagine if I'm working with sample data, so if I don't have access to data from the entire population that I'm focusing on, and I only have access to a small sample from that population, you can expect that my findings are not ever going to be 100% accurate or 100% reflective of 
the entire population. So how do I sort of quantify that? How do I put numbers to that so that I can still say I have numbers, I have objective findings um, that I can bring to the world and say, even though I don't have access to the entire population, my sample data tells a story that I can trust with a certain percentage of accuracy. And we'll see that how that role of percentages of confidence will play a big part when we get to inferential statistics. So to summarize, once again, the bullet points on, under inferential statistics, we see the idea they play an important role in hypothesis testing, which we'll get to. Um, it's how we use sample data to make inferences about the larger population that we're trying to represent or describe. Um, and also, it, inferential statistics allow us to explore multiple types of relationships between variables, not simply that is variable A associated with variable B, but do we see different types of causality? Do we see direct causality? Do we see indirect causality? Do we see a moderating relationship? All sorts of things that we'll get to later. And then as I wrapped up with a little bit earlier, um, inferential statistics help us to quantify this concept called the role of chance. Um, and because we never have data from the complete population, there's going to be uncertainty about how accurately our sample findings apply to the larger population. So we need to figure out and quantify that amount of error or chance. Um, and that's what inferential statistics is going to allow us to do. Okay, so now we have talked about what a statistic is. We've talked a little bit more about a few types of statistics very briefly, um, the symbols that are used, and also we've, we've talked about sort of how this course will progress through the two major branches of statistics. Um, and so we've talked about descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. Well, now on this slide, we take a step back and we think, well, what are we doing all this for? Why do I collect data in the first place? What's the goal of going out and surveying people or measuring certain aspects of people? What am I trying to do? Well, as a researcher, we want to establish and understand the larger world. And we want to see really what causes what, right? If I'm trying to reduce crime rates, what can I do that will cause the crime rate to go down? Or if I'm trying to design policies for a more efficient law enforcement agencies, I might think, well, what policy will cause us to start to behave in a more efficient manner, right? So we're looking for causal associations in all types of research. And causality in its simplest sense is the accuracy of the claim that one variable directly influences another variable. I mean, that's it. Um, but it, it sounds simpler on paper than once we actually get into doing the research, we realize just how complex this concept of causality actually is. So in order for us as, as individuals or scientists to be able to say that one variable directly influences another variable, I need to establish three things. And those are the numbered things that you see on this slide. So the first one, step one, association, otherwise known as covariation or correlation. So even though there are slight differences between these three words, for the most part, association, covariation, and correlation are pretty much synonymous with one another. They all capture the idea that two things or two variables move together in a predictable fashion. So you can have things where you have a positive association, whereas people who have higher values of variable A will also have higher values of variable B. Um, people who have lower values of variable A will have lower values of variable B. That would be a positive association. As one variable moves in one direction, the second variable, variable B, also moves in that same direction. You could also have negative association where people who tend to be higher scores on variable A will be low scores on variable B. And then people with lower scores on variable A will have higher scores on variable B. So there's still those two variables, A and B, are still moving in a predictable fashion. They're just moving the opposite of one another. And that's what we call a negative association. And we'll come back to that in more detail later. But the idea about capturing association or correlation, that's really simple. We have nice statistics that will do that for us and quantify the degree of association or correlation between two variables with a nice little R coefficient. 
But association, even though it's easy to do statistically and easy to compute statistically, it is not causality. And this is why we got to be careful as researchers. Just because two things are associated doesn't mean that A causes B or B causes A. It just means that they happen to have a correlation between each other. And we'll go through some examples of that as we go forward too. So beyond association, we also need to move on to the second necessary criteria for causality, which is temporal precedence. Now temporal precedence is just a fancy phrase for saying that the cause, A, occurs in time before the effect, B, right? If you just think about it in a rational mindset, if, if A causes B, well, you better see A showing up before B ever comes around. And I'll give an example of that in, when we get down to the diagram at the bottom in a moment. But we need to establish that. Now, statistically, we can't always establish temporal precedence. Temporal precedence is something that is more important in sort of the research design phase or the data collection phase. By the time we get the data in hand and we hand it off to our statistician to run some statistics, temporal precedence, we may not even be able to establish it because the data show up. So temporal precedence is really something about how do we collect our data? Do we have an experiment where we can make sure that the cause occurs before the effect? Or do we design a longitudinal study where we measure people over time and look for changes in the effect after the cause has been introduced? Um, so that's something that's more of a design issue. And then the final criterion for establishing causality is perhaps the hardest to deal with. Um, and this is known as ruling out rival explanations or ruling out rival hypotheses. And what this raises is this question. Is there something known as a confounding variable? So it's sort of a third outside variable that might be causing the observed association between the two primary variables, the cause and the effect. Now, statistically, we can use things like linear regression um, that can sort of what we will call control for confounding variables to sort of rule out some of these rival explanations. So in statistics, we do have the toolkit to rule out rival explanations. But as you'll see once we get there later in the semester, you'll realize that you can only control for, quote unquote, uh, confounding variables to the extent that you measure them at the time of your data collection. If you fail to measure some confounding variable, you can't statistically rule it out. And so that makes it hard to rely on statistics to establish step three here. So that's why also ruling out rival explanations really is a big part of sort of a research design and methodology phase. Um, the best way for ruling out rival explanations is that good old fashioned, classic, randomized, true experiment that you may recall from your research methods courses. Okay, so let's take a look at how some of these might play with our diagram at the bottom of this slide. So I'm gonna do a pretty simple example. I'm gonna say, imagine I'm studying, I wanna see whether or not drug use influences academic performance. So I wanna see, does using drugs have an impact on your academic performance. So maybe I'm studying a group of high school students. Oftentimes it's a time period where people start to dabble and experiment with potential drugs. Um, grades are really imp important. So I'm, I'm interested in this. So in my study, I say, I'm, my research question is, does drug use have an impact on academic performance? I further break that down into a testable hypothesis and I predict that the more an individual uses illicit drugs, the worse they are likely to do academically. So I have that directional thing. So my cause in this particular research situation is drug use. So that oval with the cause, you can imagine substituting in the drug use. My effect or my outcome that I think drug use is likely to impact is academic performance. So my effect is academic performance. So I may go out and collect data from several hundred high school students and I ask them a series of questions. You know, have you ever used certain types of drugs? If so, how often, in what fashion, how recently, et cetera. I can ask them questions about drug use for, to measure or operationalize my causal construct. I can also ask questions about academic performance, my effect. You know, what is your current GPA? 
what are what are the grades that are you currently getting in your courses, et cetera, right? I can ask a handful of questions. Then once I've collected that data about drug use and their academic performance, I can go back to my computer and compute the R value, the correlation statistic to see whether or not there's an association between drug use and academic performance. And so maybe I come back with a strong R value that says, yes, there is a strong association between these two variables. So I check off number one on my list of criteria for causality. I have a quantitative number that says there is in fact an association between these two variables. Well, let's move on to number two. Well, this is all about, well, how did I actually collect my data? Did I do it in a cross-sectional sort of like one survey approach where I asked both about drug use and academic performance? Or did I sort of do it in a longitudinal series of surveys over time? Because that can be important to establish what came first, right? Because I'm guessing, I'm hypothesizing that drug use came first and then that drug use influenced the outcome, which was your academic performance. Yes, that might be true, but can't you imagine the scenario where maybe it's the opposite? Maybe students who were struggling in school for many years, academic performance, doing poorly in school, all of a sudden found school boring and overwhelming. And so in order to turn and find an escape from that overwhelming nature of school, sure enough, maybe they turned to drug use. So maybe academic performance had an influence on whether or not you use drugs, right? And you can imagine the opposite end of the spectrum there where students who are doing really well academically may feel that they have no desire to turn to drugs because they're setting themselves up for academic success and they don't want to hinder it with any drug use, right? So that's why it's so important that we think about, well, what, can we establish which thing came first? the drug use or the academic performance level. And then finally, you'll see in this diagram down at the bottom, that oval with the two black arrows pointing away from it, we see the word confounding. Now this ties into number three, that idea of a confounding variable that may be actually influencing our two primary variables, giving us a false sense of causal association between the cause and the effect. So what might be an example of this? Well, imagine, what may have an influence on whether or not you use drugs and also have an influence on how well you do in school? Well, let's imagine your home life, right? There's many aspects of your home life. If you live in a home where you have parents who use drugs or drink too much and don't value education, you can see how that becomes a confounding variable that can influence your access and opportunities to use drugs, the cause, and also may have an influence on how well you do in school, right? Whether it's valued in your family, whether it, you don't have a comfortable home environment to study and prepare, whether your parents aren't there to assist you, you can see how that becomes this sort of, this confounding explanation that may actually be sort of the driving force between the connection be between drug use and academic performance. So, you can imagine there's a lot of confounding variables. It could be peer groups. It could be your overall intelligence. It could be other behavioral issues, psychological issues that could have an impact. But so trying to rule out all these rival explanations can be a difficult thing. So now it's time to go over a handful of other sort of vocabulary terms. Um, so these are like basic concepts and terms that are that you will hear or read about when you're whether you're looking at a statistics book, whether you're reading a research article. And so we want to make sure you kind of understand them before we start using them in a more common fashion throughout the rest of the semester. So we've already defined statistic. Yeah. So remember a statistic is a single number or point estimate that describes some aspect of a sample. Well, on the flip side of it is what is known as a parameter. And the parameter in its simplest definition is the population value of a statistic. And I say here that it's usually an unknown value. Why do I say that? Well, as I mentioned earlier, we start with descriptive statistics, that first branch, right? Where we get statistics from samples and we describe what's going on. Well, once we move into inferential statistics, we wanna use that sample data, those sample statistics to 
make estimates about what's going on in the larger population. So we want to predict the unknown population values. And that's where this idea of parameter comes into the realm of the larger realm of statistics. So we try to predict parameters more often than not using inferential statistics. And in fact, you'll see that come to light once we get to hypothesis testing and we set up our competing hypotheses, you'll see me use parameter um, terminology and parameter symbols within those hypotheses. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind right, for right now. Um, the other thing we want to think about is just as we saw symbols that would represent various statistics, there are also corresponding symbols for parameters. So this chart here shows how there may be, there's a statistic, so sample data, data taken from a sample, you compute a statistic. So for the mean, you have that X bar. Well, then when I'm trying to predict what's going on in the population, so if I want to predict the population mean, I'm talking about the parameter. And for when we use symbols for that in mathematical formulas, we now use, typically you'll see lowercase Greek letters. And so instead of using the X bar, when we look at the parameter for mean, we would see it represented with the lowercase Greek letter mu, which kind of looks like a weird U, or sometimes it looks kind of like a W, or an upside down W, or a, a fancy M, um, depending upon the font and how you interpret it. Same idea with the standard deviation. When we're dealing with sample data, we see that lowercase um, s. Uh, but when we're trying to refer to a parameter for hypothesis testing, we will see the lowercase Greek letter sigma that you see there illustrated. And finally, one other example is for the correlation coefficient, where in statistics, we see that lowercase r when we're trying to refer to a parameter or the population value of the correlation, we see the lowercase Greek letter rho, um, which looks kind of like a smooth P. Sometimes it's, it's closed, sometimes it's not. So once again, it's about font. Um, but I just want you to get used to, as we start to look at various um, formulas, I don't want you to be intimidated or feel like you don't know what it, you're looking at just because you see some of these symbols. These symbols, once you know what they correspond to, it's very, it's basic and pretty easy to understand a lot of the mathematical stuff that we'll be seeing. A few more words in the vocabulary uh, section are, is another way to, that we often see either textbooks or how people sort of approach the realm or the field of statistics in general. I've talked about, and I, I said earlier that I'm going to teach this course with sort of a focus on the two branches of statistics, descriptive statistics and then going into inferential statistics. Other people will approach statistics by breaking it down as far as well, how many variables are we analyzing at any particular time? And that's what we see with these three terms on this page. So when you see, anytime you hear the word univariate statistics, well, una, uni means one, right? So univariates and variate just means it refers to variables. So univariate statistics are any statistical techniques that are used to describe one variable. And these typically fall within the realm of descriptive statistics. Um, then we move on. So what if I want to analyze or describe more than one variable? Well, let's start with two, right? So we have bivariate. Bi meaning two. Bivariate statistics are any techniques that are used to describe and analyze relationships between two variables. So I think you get the idea of where I'm going with this. And then finally, we have multivariate statistics. And this is whenever we're trying to analyze relationships between more than two variables. Um, or when we want to analyze relationship between two variables after controlling for the effects of one or more other variables. That term controlling for, you may recall from a previous slide when I was talking about ruling out rival hypotheses. And so this multivariate statistics, we will deal with that more towards the end of this course um, when we start to talk about things called factorial ANOVAs and linear regression. So the first you know, month or two of this course is going to be much more focused on univariate and bivariate statistics. Finally, within the realms of vocabulary, we have to talk about um, two sort of branches of inferential statistics. So if inferential statistics refers to any time we're using sample data to make estimates or inferences about what's going on in the larger population, well, there's sort of two major approaches of the type of statistical test you can do. There are what we refer to as parametric methods, 
And then there are what we refer to as non-parametric methods. So let's start with parametric methods. So they're a part of inferential statistics. Okay. What parametric methods do is they test our estimates of population parameters using sample data. So you're starting to see some of these terms, parameters, samples, statistics coming up. Hopefully you're starting to get the idea, right? So when we get into inferential statistics, we will start with looking at some parametric methods, things like the independent samples t-test, the one-way ANOVA. These are some of the inferential tests that we're going to do that fall under this umbrella of being parametric. We are going to see how we can use them where we take sample data and then we use that data to try to draw conclusions or make estimates about the larger population. We're trying to predict those unknown population parameters. So, but what makes a parametric method, what, what's unique about them? Well, the uniqueness is in order to successfully use a parametric method, you have to make assumptions about the distribution of whatever you're studying in the larger population, and you have to meet those assumptions. So as we go through the vast majority of uh, inferential tests that we are going to talk about this semester are parametric methods. We're going to talk about the independent samples t-test, the paired t-test, the one-way ANOVA, linear regression, etc. All of these, when we get to them, we're going to talk about when to use those tests, why I might choose to use those tests, but we're also going to talk about the assumptions of those tests. And it's important that we cover those assumptions because in order to use things like an independent samples t-test properly, you have to assess the assumptions by looking at your sample data and make sure that your data fit those assumptions. Because if they do fit those assumptions, that means your findings from that parametric test are going to be valid and they're going to have a fancy thing. They're going to have what we call power. So parametric methods have more power than other inferential tests when the assumptions are met. And that's the key thing. And sadly, a lot of researchers and a lot of people trying to use statistics forget to test or check these assumptions before they start using some of these tests. And it, you can imagine, I mean, if you're if you're not checking the assumptions and you fail them, then your findings are not accurate. They're not, they're not going to be valid. And so it's really important that we think about these when choosing parametric methods. We'll also talk more about and define at a, in a later lecture what this concept of power is all about. And we'll talk about the things that influence power because it really is um, an important part of, of statistics. But okay, so let's say I do, I collect my data. I want to do a hypothesis test, do some inferential statistics, but I realize, uh-oh, my data does not meet the assumptions of the particular parametric method that I want to use. Do I just give up and go home? No, I don't. What I do is I turn to a non-parametric method. This is sort of like choice B, right? So non-parametric methods are also types of inferential statistics, but the key thing about them is they do not make any assumptions about the distribution of what your studying is. So they're known as distribution free. So we can use them as sort of as a backup when we can't fit the assumptions of parametric methods. Now, do non-parametric methods have that same accuracy and power as parametric methods? No, they don't. But are they really that bad? No. I mean, they're just like a step down. It's like if you go to the Olympics and you want to compete for a medal and you want to be the best, winning the gold medal, you're the greatest. Good for you. Pat yourself on the back. You're number one, right? But heck, I don't know about you, but unless you're one of the elite of the elite, if you go to the Olympics and you come home with a silver, I imagine you're still going to be somewhat happy. You still establish yourself as a pretty darn good athlete in whatever field, right? And that's kind of the thing I think about between parametric methods being sort of the gold standard and non-parametric methods being sort of that silver standard, right? Not quite as good, but pretty darn good, right? Um, definitely not worth just giving up on everything. So we'll see, and I'll talk more about these concepts once we get to inferential statistics in a few weeks. So let's transition here to start talking about data and variables. Um, I Oftentimes when I teach this course, I think people walk into a stats course and they start talking about, oh, our data looks like this and the variables are blah, 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 and just go extremely fast, sort of overlooking the fact that a lot of students may 
not really have a, a crystal clear understanding of what the word data means and what the word variable or variables means. So let's take a look at this. What we see on this particular um, slide is an illustration of a data set. So that little chart over on the right hand side is a data set. We have 10 different people, 10 different research subjects. As, and how do I know that? Well, the very first column in that chart, you'll notice, has an I. I, we will be talking about more as we go forward. I is known as a case counter, or it's a way of identifying, or an ID, or of knowing how many research subjects or responses you have in your data. So that first column isn't anything about variables, it's just a case counter. So you'll notice it goes one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to 10. So it's representing that we have 10 cases or 10 responses in our database. Then within our data, we have four distinct variables. And the variables are all measuring some different characteristic or aspect of our research respondents. So we have variable one, which I just gave a letter W to. Variable two, which I refer to as X. Variable three is, it has a Y and variable uh, four has a Z. So we have four variables, W, X, Y, and Z, each one of them measuring some unique data or, excuse me, some unique characteristic from our sample. So let's take a look at what we have here. You'll notice in that chart where we've got all the raw data, you don't see any words. But oftentimes when we go out and collect data from individuals, we ask things like, well, what is your gender? And a gender isn't measured as zero, one, two, three. Usually people will say things like male, female, et cetera, right? They use a word. Well, that's fine when collecting data, but when we deal with statistics, statistics does not like words. Statistics likes numbers. So you'll notice that's why in our chart, all you see are numbers. But yet when you look at over at the variable descriptions on the left, you'll notice that some of our variables need to have words coded or translated in to numbers. And we'll talk about the importance of that when we move on to the levels of measurement on the next slide. So for a moment, let's just take a quick look and think about the uniqueness or what's going on with each one of these variables, because I'll come back to it in a few slides and see if you can recognize the appropriate level of measurement for each one of them. So the first, imagine we go out and we collect individuals who are about ready to go to prison, right? So they're getting off the bus, they've been brought out to the prison, and the first 10 people who get off the bus, we ask them a series of questions. First, we ask them, well, what's your current offense? And we're calling this variable W. And they say, whatever they say, we code it into one of those four levels or one of those four categories, property, drug, violent, or other. And we don't just give it by that word, but before we enter it into the data set, you'll notice we have given each one of those names, property, drug, violent, other, we've given each one of those a number to represent that group. Now, does that number really have any mathematical meaning? No, it's just a placeholder, right? I could have had drug as number one and property as number two, or I could have mixed them up any other way. I just chose to say one is property, two is drug, three is violent, four is other. So, and then you can see in our data set, sort of the illustration of our, our example or sample of individuals. So, you know, person number three, well, their W value is three. So I go back to the coding system. Oh, that must be that they're serving time for a violent offense and so forth. Let's move on to variable X. Variable X is number of prior arrests. So as these people are getting off the bus, I ask them, how many prior arrests did you have? And they look at it, you'll notice I don't need to code that because the number itself tells the whole story. That's gonna be another important clue when we get to levels of measurement. If the number tells the whole story, that may be an indicator of the type of variable that we're looking at. So for number of prior arrests, they just say, oh, I had three prior arrests. I had one, I had nine, I had 12, whatever. And I just record that number because that tells me everything I need to know. Um, I move on to variable Y. Now variable Y is their classification level. And you'll notice there is sort of a ranking going on. Minimum, medium, maximum, supermaximum, right? 
So as we go from minimum and then continue going up, there's a ranking, but it's sort of a subjective breakdown, right? It's not a concrete difference. Like what's the difference between minimum and medium versus medium and maximum? Um, and there is sort of a subjectivity, although there is some ranking. Um, and you'll notice I also, for classification level, I had to assign numbers, right? And the numbers this time, even though they were somewhat arbitrarily chosen, there's an order to them. They, the number value sort of corresponds with the level of classification, whereas I get to a higher number, I'm getting to a more severe or higher level of classification. So that's going to be an indicator of the type of level of measurement of variable Y. Finally, we have variable Z. Variable Z is their age. Imagine it's age in years. So as these uh, individuals are getting off the bus, I say, well, how old are you? I'm 24, I'm 21, I'm 29, I'm 31, et cetera, right? And once again, the number tells the whole story. I don't need to have any sort of coding scheme to represent the different age levels. Rather, I can just input those specific numbers. So with this in mind, we're gonna now move on to talking about levels of measurement of variables, and then we'll come back to these four variables and see if you can uh, um, properly identify the level of measurement for each one of them. So now that we've got a glimpse of what exactly a data set looks like and what variables are, and kind of given some hints as to the importance of rank or no rank, numbers or no numbers, coding, things of that nature, now let's go into breaking this down into a little more detail and talk about the levels of measurement of variables. Now the levels of measurement and understanding how to correctly assess the level of measurement of any particular variable is of key importance in statistics. Why? Well, certain statistics and certain statistical tests are only designed to be used with variables that are at a certain level of measurement. So as a researcher, if you wanna do be accurate in what you're computing and how you're sort of explaining or identifying or understanding your variables, you need to understand what is the level of measurement of each of those variables so that you can then apply it to the appropriate statistic or statistical test. Um, and as we go through this course, I will remind you over and over again of the importance of matching a variable's level of measurement to the ap appropriate statistical procedure. So when we think about breaking down levels of measurement, the first breakdown is to differentiate between what are known as qualitative variables and quantitative variables. Now, you'll notice if you look at the first bullet point for both of these, both qualitative and quantitative, that first bullet point is the same because all variables measure some quality or characteristic of our research subject, right? If I ask you, what is your age? Once you tell me your age, that is capturing some characteristic about your age, right? If I ask you, what is your gender? That's capturing a characteristic. If I ask you, what is your race or ethnicity? Same idea. If I ask you how well, you know, what your current GPA is in, in college, that's capturing a certain characteristic. If I want to know your opinion about some movie, once again, I'm capturing a characteristic. I think you get the idea, right? So a variable is I'm capturing some characteristic from the research subject. But now, what differentiates qualitative from quantitative? The key thing that you're going to notice here is how we use numbers. Numbers are going to be the backbone of differentiating between qualitative and quantitative. So let's start with qualitative variables. Looking at the second bullet point under qualitative variables, you'll see various characteristics that are being measured have no clear numerical value. And then moving on to the next bullet point, if numbers are used to identify different characteristics of a variable, aka coding, those numbers have no inherent mathematical value. So what do I mean by no inherent mathematical value? I mean things like a value of three doesn't mean that you're more valuable than categories one and two, right? You can't have rank. Um, sometimes you can't necessarily have addition or subtraction values. When you're looking at qualitative variables, similar to what we saw with our example, sometimes with variables, I just have words or categories and I need to capture them or just code them with a particular number. These are qualitative variables. And the two levels of measurement that correspond to qualitative variables are nominal and ordinal. And we're gonna go into more detail about them on the next slide. So hold off on that. 
Quantitative variables, on the other hand, as the name quant implies, the quantity or the numbers start to matter. So they measure a quality or characteristic, just like any variable, but the various characteristics that are being measured have a clear ranking and numerical value. And in this case, this is similar to those, those examples that I said before, where the numbers tell the whole story. Numbers are used to identify the level of the characteristic being measured, and those numbers have mathematical value where you can use mathematical uh, properties such as addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, uh, the use of ratios and fractions. And we'll see that in a few moments. So the, le the two levels of measurement that correspond to quantitative variables are interval and ratio. And so now we've got sort of four levels of measurement, nominal, ordinal, interval, ratio. And as we go from nominal all the way up to ratio, you'll, as you'll see in the next couple slides, they become, they keep adding another characteristic. It's sort of like a step ladder approach. So let's take a look at those four levels of measurement. So starting with the qualitative levels. So the first two levels of measurement are nominal and ordinal. So they're qualitative, meaning that they're capturing some characteristic from the research subject, but it's more of a descriptive characteristic. It's not a numerically based characteristic. So if we use numbers, those are simply as placeholders to represent some characteristic. So nominal, so data are grouped into categories. The ranking, there's no real rank across different categories. Numbers may be used to identify categories, but those numbers have no inherent mathematical value. So some classic examples of qualitative variables are things like gender, right? Male, female, transgender, they're just a category. You can't say that one gender is better or more valuable or ranks higher or lower than another. No, they're just different groups. Political party, right? Republican, Democrat, Green Party, Libertarian, etc. They're just a category. We can't, I mean, we could joke around and make political jokes, but for the most part, you can't rank them, right? You can't say one party's better or worse than another. Race or ethnicity, same idea. Say even the idea of a current offense, where we saw on our earlier example. You know, we've got property, drug, violent. They're just categories. And unless you know more about the specific offense, you can't even rank them, right? There's certain drug offenses that are a lot worse than violent offenses and property offenses that may be worse than both of them, right? I mean, it just depends upon what exactly it is. But as it is, if I just say I'm serving time for a property offense versus a violent offense versus a drug offense, that's just a category, right? So that would be what an example of nominal. And I wrap up there with your favorite sport, right? Um, you know, whether you're a soccer lover, a baseball lover, football lover, basketball lover, hockey lover, etc., cetera, um, it's just a category. There's no clear ranking, and the, you can see the, you, there's no numbers going through there. But I, if I, for statistics, I could identify each category with a particular number. And we'll see when we start using our statistical software why the, the importance of using that coding mechanism, even for nominal variables, to have numbers serve as a placeholder, but nothing else. As we move up the level of measurement and go one, later, one step up the ladder, we move up to ordinal. Now, ordinal variables are still in that qualitative realm, but as sort of that the name implies, ordinal order or rank matters. So that's the one thing that's been added here. So the data are grouped into categories that have an obvious ranking, meaning that category two is higher than category one, category three is higher than categories one and two, et cetera. Um, and, but as with all qualitative variables, numbers may be used to identify categories, but still those numbers have no inherent mathematical value. They're just a placeholder. Um, and I guess you could go as far as with an ordinal variable to say that the numbers represent a higher or lower rank, but that's about it. So examples that we typically see in our field are things like the Likert scale. Now, what do I mean by the Likert scale? The Likert scale is that classic sort of measure that we see on surveys where it's like a five to seven point level of agreement where they'll give you a statement like, you know, like, um, I feel sad when my friends get hurt, right? And then they give you a variety of responses from completely disagree all the way up to completely agree, right? Where there's a scale of sort of agreement or scale of frequency. Those are what are known as Likert scale responses. And they fit this sort of ordinal uh, 
um, level where there's sort of words, but there's also clearly a ranking. Now it's a subjective ranking. You know, as I go from completely disagree to disagree to neutral and so forth, the distance between each one of those categories is rather subjective. And that's why it sort of stays in this ordinal level. Um, things about like military or law enforcement rank, right? Not everyone moves up the sort of the hierarchy at the same speed or with the same accolades. Um, so there, even though there's clearly a rank, and if you talk to anyone in military or law enforcement, they recognize who's higher ranked than them and who's lower ranked than them and knows how to respond accordingly. But there's not necessarily like a, uh, an objective, you know, like the, dis the gap from each rank isn't necessarily the same. And so that would make it ordinal. Level of education, same idea, right? If I had a question on a survey where I asked, what is your level of education? And it's, you know, less than a high school degree and then high school or GE diploma, and then, you know, an AA degree, then a bachelor's degree, master's, et cetera. You can imagine those are not fixed intervals as we go up that ladder of spacing. Um, some people may take different times, so but there's clearly a rank of lower education to higher education. These would all be examples of ordinal level variables. Now let's take a look at the higher ends of the level of measurement, the two top levels. And these are the ones that fall under the quantitative area, and these are interval and ratio level variables. So as I discussed before, once we get into quantitative variables, as in the quantity, the numbers matter, right? So here, the numbers tell the whole story by themselves. It's no longer just words to capture categories. The numbers matter. So with interval level data, as sort of the name implies, the term interval, many people will say, well, it's because now we know, not only do we categorize people, not only do we have a clear ranking from one end of the, the responses to the other, but there is a sort of a fixed interval in between each category or each level of responses. So for interval variables, data are collected from subjects in the form of numerical responses to questions. So that number matters. There is a clear order of rank from one value to the next. So higher values indicate higher, you know, um, amount of that particular characteristic. Lower values indicate a lower amount. Um, but here's what makes it quantitative because there are equal intervals between the groups or values. Um, and the numerical responses do have mathematical properties, specifically addition and subtraction. So let's look at some examples. Some classic interval level variable examples include things like age and years, right? I mean, I know we can talk about leap years and slight differences, but for the most part, you know, we think about a year as being sort of a fixed interval, roughly 365 give or take days um, takes up a year or 12 months or 52 weeks, however we break it down. So if, if somebody is four years old and somebody else is eight years old, we can say, oh, the person who is eight is four years older, right? Mathematics, um, than the person who was four. Um, height in inches, right? If I go out and measure somebody who is 54 inches versus somebody who's 56, well, somebody, that person who is 54 is two inches shorter than somebody who is 56, right? Uh, temperature in Fahrenheit or Celsius, the same idea where we sort of have this fixed interval of how things go. And then finally, at the top end of it, we have ratio level variables. So ratio level variables capture everything from the lower levels. They have, they capture characteristics of individuals. There is a clear ranking. Um, the, we use numerical responses and those numbers have mathematical meaning and there's equal intervals between the groups or values of that particular variable. But what makes ratio level variables unique is that fourth bullet point under the ratio, and that is the fact that the value of zero is now a possible response for that variable, and that value of zero indicates complete absence of the trait being measured. And this kind of becomes sort of the gray area for many people between deciding if a variable's interval or ratio is, and for ratio, zero has to be possible and it has to indicate complete absence of whatever that trait is. And then as you can see with the final bullet point um, in black, that the numerical responses have various mathematical properties open to them. So what are some examples of ratio? So points on an exam, right? Numbers matter, right? If say it's a 10 point exam, 
you know, we know that if you get a seven and somebody else gets a nine, that person with nine, not only are they higher than you, but they're two points higher than you. Also on an exam, it is possible to get zero, right? If you get all the, the questions wrong, you could get a zero on the exam and it's a possible response. And it means complete absence of points on an exam. Um, sentence length. If we're looking at offenders who have been sentenced to jail or prison and, and we measure it in days, right? It's possible that somebody, for whatever reason, the judge or jury or whatever decides that they're, they're not going to get a sentence length, whether they're acquitted or they're given some, you know, a fine instead and their sentence length is zero um, or whether it's, you know, 30 days or 60 days or whatever, the numbers matter. Um, number of prior arrests. Once again, the numbers matter and you can see how um, zero is possible. I imagine a lot of you who are listening to this, if I said, how many prior arrests do you have? You're going to go, uh, none, zero, right? So that zero becomes an important um, response to make something a ratio level measurement. Now, just quickly to sort of like give a contrast to it, let's look at the examples that we had for the interval uh, description, right? Age. Well, age, you're like, well, it seems to have a lot of the ratio stuff, but zero. And I don't mean to get into a, I don't know, philosophical discussion or argument here, but we could go on for days. Like, is, is there such thing as a true zero in age, right? When are you absolutely zero? And, you know, you can imagine all the opportunities. Height. Is it possible for a living individual to be zero inches tall, right? And this is kind of that gray area. Temperature. Fair, zero degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius it does not mean complete absence of temperature, right? Um, so as we'll see on the next slide, this gray area between interval and ratio, the good news is we'll kind of put it aside because we're going to merge them together in a second. But for right now, I want you to at least sort of understand it. So let's take a look. We've seen nominal, ordinal, our qualitative level ones. Interval, ratio, our quantitative level ones. Let's see if we can go back to that initial example of data and variable that we saw a few slides ago and figure out what level of measurement each one of those variables was. All right, so this is what we saw several slides ago. We have four variables, W, which is current offense, X, which is number of prior arrests, Y, which is our classification level, and Z, which is age. Let's see if you can match each one of these four variables with the correct level of measurement. And so whenever you're ready, you can jump to the next slide where you'll see the answers. So take a look at yourself and see and if, if this is not clear to you that current offense was nominal, number of prior arrest was ratio, classification level was ordinal, and age was interval, then go back, take a look at the descriptions and explanations of each one of them. And then I'll also be posting uh, some practice questions on Beachboard, which should also be able to help you further practicing understanding level of measurement. Because as I said earlier, Understanding a level of measurement is one of the most important things we need to be able to do in order to even start doing statistical analysis. A couple last minute reminders about level of measurement. So as I have sort of stressed several times over the last couple slides is this, the level of measurement determines the types of statistics and statistical tests that can be computed. That's why it's so important for people to make sure they wrap their mind around the differences between nominal, ordinal, interval, ratio. Um, a second thing is, even though we, in most statistics courses, we talk about four levels of measurement, when we actually start doing statistical analysis, we really sort of condense it into three. Um, these, this breakdown of sort of three levels of measurement is really what matters statistically for us when choosing the appropriate statistical test. Um, so when choosing the appropriate statistical test, we want to make sure we can understand the difference between nominal variables versus ordinal variables versus the interval ratio variables. So we're kind of just merging together interval ratio for statistical purposes. And then finally, and I'll mention this a few times throughout the semester, as researchers, we always want to be wary or a little bit skeptical when we see research articles where they treat Likert scale responses as if they were interval level variables. Um, by definition, they're not. They are an, a qualitative variable. They're ordinal. They're a subjective ranking. They're not a quantitative ranking. Um, but yet, in a lot of research studies, people like to treat Likert scale responses and treat them almost as if 
the difference between completely disagree and disagree and neutral and so forth are as if they're on fixed intervals, which they're not. So you always, I want you to just encourage you to be skeptical if you see that when you're reviewing literature.